Thank you. All right. How are you doing? Oh, come on. I, I do it again. All right. How are you doing? That's what I wanted to hear. Awesome. Um, okay. Let's get started. So, actually, 10 years ago, I was listening to a podcast called The Java Posse. And um, the Java Posse, they were actually talking about a new continuous integration server called Hudson at that time. And they were talking, and I, I knew Cruise Control, and I thought, okay, I give Hudson a chance, installed it on a, on a server somewhere, pointed it to my, at that time, CVS repository, showed it my aunt, aunt script, and um, then let it run. The next day, something magic happened. I got an email from this Hudson server telling me that uh, a, a test failed. I said, wow, I didn't do anything. I just committed my code, and Hudson told me that the test failed. I thought this was really a magical moment. I think this was actually, for me, the rise of the machines. All right. So where we are now. I mean, continuous integration, that's, that's a part of our software, daily software development. We're getting more into continuous deployment in the cloud. Um, and also, also in our day-to-day our -day lives, uh, we, we, we're getting more and more bots coming in. Um, I want to have this, this one here, uh, automatic vacuum cleaner, cleaning my apartment when I'm not there. Um, that would be cool. My wife keeps telling me that's too expensive, Sven. Well, maybe I just buy one. Anyway, um, or, or this one here, home automation. Yeah, I can, I can turn on my, my, my light bulbs with, with Wi-Fi, turn it on and off again. Um, this nest is heating up my apartment when I'm approaching home. All cool stuff. Um, or, or, or this one here. Uh, yeah, cars that are driving around without, a, without any driver. So, um, well, said that is maybe we are not, we're not really there yet, and they're still testing that, but Volvo, actually, they, they, they are there. Um, they have this human detector. So this car stops when a, when, when a human is, is in front of it. So, um, and and that, that's really working, working quite well. Um, just, just demo here. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> shit. Uh. Yeah, maybe it's still a little, little bit experimental, so maybe we shouldn't trust that bots that much. Um, but going, going back to software development, actually. Um, we're here for software development. So rise of the machines in software development, as I said, continuous integration, great, we're there. Um, I'm, I'm an old Java veteran. Um, my name is Sven, I work for Atlassian. And if we talk, I, I've seen a lot, of, a lot of bots, actually, and that's also what I, what I put into this keynote, some bots that I saw that other teams use, using. So if we think about automation, if I talk to people about automation, they immediately think about, okay, automatic deployments, Automatically all builds and tests, and then we have some small scripts running around somewhere on the servers. That's automation. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. We can automate much, much more in software development. We can automate our engineering health, our support, yes, um, status updates, code reviews, and ops. So it, we, we can automate a, a lot of things. So I've been talking to, to a lot of developers um, from within Atlassian and without, uh, outside of Atlassian. Um, and then I found some bots, and I put them in these categories. So, Bots that helps us during our coding phase, during our testing phase, some, some bots in operations, and then some, some that helps us to doing some, actually some support. Um, so let's, let's start with some, some bots in, during our coding phase. If you're going to a party and you're saying, hey, I'm a developer, people think this. OK, this person is just sitting there and writing code the whole day. Well, we know better. We're, we, we, we're not just uh, code monkeys. Um, so we are actually doing uh, code reviews. We, we think about how can we best deploy stuff to the cloud. Uh, we have to update our issue trackers. Uh, we have to think about our, our continuous deployment, continuous integration servers, and then our branch strategy. So there's much, much involved in, in, in software development than just coding. But we want to code. So let's, let, let's, let's get rid of something here. So um, maybe let's get rid of the issue tracker. You might think, this guy's from Atlassian, so, and he's saying we're getting rid of the issue tracker. Well, let, let me show you. Um, 
So a typical issue tracker workflow looks like this. And I've seen a lot of workflows, but this is an easy, typical uh, issue tracker workflow. The issue is in to do, in progress, in review, and then it's done. Well, the coding workflow looks, looks, looks like this. Um, we branch, then we, we create our feature branch, and then we code. We refactor maybe a little bit. We do a pull request. Uh, people review the code, and then we merge. Um, so this is actually what, what, what you should do. So you set the issue in progress, and then you branch code, blah, blah, blah. Then you do a pull request. The issue should be in review now. And then we merge, and the issue is done. Well, this is what we should do, actually. Um, what we normally do is we, we create the code, we branch, we make the pull request, we're done, we merge, we're done. And then somebody asks us, what's with this issue? Have you updated it? Oh, sorry, I forgot to update the issue. Well, let me just go into to do in progress and review. It's done now. Very fast. 10 seconds, issue done. Good job. Um, yeah, this really happens, and, but it's, it's, it's important. You might think, okay, this is too much overhead, but it's important to keep the team updated. We want to keep the team updated, what's going on, uh, which issues are we working on, uh, which problems are we currently working on. So we've been looking uh, into some solutions. So we found this here, the Epoch Motive. Uh, you can set it on your head, and then you just think about, open, open your issue tracker and think about, this issue is now in progress. And then it drags automatically over to the next column and the issue drops the issue in progress. Isn't that great? That's cool, isn't it? Wow. Well, said that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually the same thing. I just don't use my, the mouse, but um, it's, it's the same thing. But what, 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 what a lot of issue trackers offer these days are so-called so smart commits. Um, so you mention actually the issue key in your commit message and then you can actually control the issue tracker. And a lot of issue trackers are, are, are um, offering that, like, like, like GitHub, Utrecht, Trello, Jira, Bitbucket, you name it. Um, so most of the issue trackers are offering that. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty easy. You just type start progress, and the issue tracker transition is over, start review, transition is over, and then fixes, blah, 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 and transitions the issue over. Very, very easy. And it's good, because we don't have to switch tools anymore. We can stay in our IDEs. That's great. But the robot is just still receiving commands. This is not intelligent. The robot is just, just stupid and just receives commands. Yeah, I'm moving the issue over. Um, so why don't we just control the issues by action? So instead of just putting it in the commit message, we create a branch with the issue key and associate the, the issue together with the branch. So we have a, have, a, have a combination there. So we branch, and then the issue tracker is so smart that it transitions the issue over. Uh, we do a pull request, and the issue tracker is so smart that it says, OK, good, the issue is now in review. And then we, we, we merge the code back, and uh, the issue tracker sees that and transitions the issue over. Um, when I heard that uh, the people in Sydney are developing on that, I was just going, yay, this is cool. So it's, it's in the newest Jira and Bitbucket version, and I'm sure the other issue tracker vendors will follow us uh, on that track um, to, to, to have that too. Um, but this is not, not the only. We can also have some more little workflow help us that helps us with our coding workflow and our branch, pull, and merge workflow that we're doing. Um, so, for example, this here. Uh, you have this new person on the team, cool new guy, um, and, and, and this, this person actually commits directly to the master branch, and all of a sudden, okay, the build is red, but this person is so cool, can fix the bug just, just like this, fix it is, the build, the build is green again. Okay, great. Well, maybe not, because there was, was a developer actually and, and this developer was doing it the proper way, creating a branch, coding, and then run a build on the, on the feature branch. And then found out, oh, the build is red. And then looking, looking around, looking, looking here and there, and said, I can't understand, why, why is the build red? I don't know. It's a bad surprise. But bad surprises happen, actually. Um, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't. So instead of that, we have a bot, actually, that prevents us. From, from doing that. So this, this Git hook, it's actually a Git hook, um, is, is preventing us from creating a branch when the build is red on the master branch. So we're not allowed to branch the master branch when the build is red. Um, this way, we're saving a lot of time um, looking, looking for the bug. Uh, okay, um, another question. Who should review my code? 
Who's the best person to review my code? I always invite my friends to the pull request because they are friendly to me. They approve everything uh, I do. Not the best thing to do. So, but the best people actually to, to review the code are the people that actually have written the code. So you look in the commit history, and these people are the best people that can judge if I did something wrong or to review the code. Well, instead of me looking at it, I can have a bot looking at it. And that's what we also did. It's a free add-on for Bitbucket, and it suggests auto-reviewers. So automatic, look at that, and suggest reviewers that would be the best persons here to review that code. Um, so always invite the right reviewers. And then we have actually also sometimes a little bit strict workflow, um, and we say, okay, good, we invite maybe five people for a pull request, um, and then if two people approve it, we're good to merge. So that's a Git hook too, so if two people approve it, we are okay to merge before we can't merge the code. We need two approvals, so have a, have a minimum amount of approvers. All right, let's go on with some, some, some bots and testing that helps us to better, better test our code. Samara test automation. We are developers, and development is a craft, and we're trying hard to write beautiful code. And I think everyone here in, in this room knows the feeling when you have, we have crafted a great class, a great architecture, we are so happy about it, when we have written our awesome class. So beautiful, we are so proud of it. We close the IDE, open it again, looking at the code again, say, oh, that was so brilliant, awesome. And then, okay, good, job done, we're going on vacation. And then one month later, we're looking back at our awesome class, and we want to see it again. And then we see, oh, people have changed it in the meantime. People have come to it and changed it. Oh, my God, what happened to my awesome class? Not awesome anymore. Well, let me tell you this. You're laughing, but... I've been working on a lot of projects, and this happened to every code base. To every code base, gets older, mm, doesn't look good anymore. Why are developers doing that? Well, so developers don't write bad code on purpose. We don't go in and say, oh, this is so good code, let's mess this up. We don't do that. Well, sometimes maybe. Uh, anyway, so, no, we're trying just to solve problems. That's what, what we want to do. We want to solve the problem. Problem solved. OK, go to the next problem. OK, we forgot to make it beautiful again. But yeah, we should care about our engineering health. So we should, we should have a person that looks constantly at the engineering health. We call him Dr. Code. And uh, Dr. Code measures constantly the engineering health. Of course, Dr. Code is not a human. It's a bot that's looking in that. And it started out when we wanted to move from JUnit 3 to JUnit 4. So we said, no more JUnit 3 tests. Instead of refactoring everything uh, to JUnit 4, we said, no more JUnit 3 tests. Uh, just the new test has to be written at JUnit 4 test. So somebody wrote actually this stupid counter class that counted the JUnit 3 tests, compared it uh, with, with, a, with a value in the database, and that's it. Um, and also, people found that so useful that they came up and said, oh, that's so good. Let's add some more tasks to Dr. Code. So we have written a lot, of, a lot of things here. And the thing is, if you got caught by Dr. Code, we, have a little, uh, we put a little bit cultural pressure on that. If you got caught by Dr. Code, you enter the hall of shame. Shame on you. So we call you out. We show your picture on the television and say, wow, you messed it up. You really messed it up. So it looks like this, our hall of shame. Um, but said that if you, if you fix something, um, you can also enter the hall of fame again and be, be, be proud of you again. So um, that helps us a little bit to, to fix, fix stuff um, in our code base. Um, and then we're, we're testing our code base, of course. We're, we're, test, we're testing, testing everything. Um, and you might know that Jira is a, is, a, is, a, is a very old product. It's now, I think, 15 years old, so the code base. So we have a, a lot of tests. And our functional tests, actually, they ran for hours. So what did we do? Yeah, we split them up. So we, we split them up so we, they can run in parallel. So I have more servers running the test in parallel. Great. Well. We, we found a problem in here because this is our, our splitting up, and then we found out that we always have to wait for the longest running test. Always for this one, we have to wait until we say, okay, the build is green, everything is fine. So instead of 
statically slicing and dicing our functional test, we actually uh, built a, a test, functional test balancer called Hallelujah. And Hallelujah is just taking, taking the functional test and dispatches this to the next free build server. Uh, pretty easy, um, but pretty effective. And we saved, we saved a lot of engineering time by, by having Hallelujah. A lot of build time is saved by, by having Hallelujah running. And at the end, we can say earlier, OK, this build is green. Great, we love green builds, we're happy. But sometimes things go wrong and uh, the build, build gets red. Well, it's okay. I mean, that's why we have a, a build server that tells us, okay, test failed, look at it, fix it again. It's okay. Um, but then we, we look at the test and say, why, why does the test fail? I have no clue. Huh, huh. So what do you do? Yeah, you press rerun. So, you rerun the test and see, that can't be true. And then the test is green. Oh, and that is the frustrating moment because you just discovered a flaky test. The test is flaky, sometimes green, sometimes red. Or maybe the code underneath is flaky, which is, which is really worse. Um, so we wrote actually a flaky test detector. So let me show you what a flaky test detector does. Well, the flaky test detector detects, okay, test is failing. Then the flaky test detector says, okay, I rerun the test. Oh, now it's green. So this test, or the code underneath, must be flaky. Um, so we continue the build, uh, and then we put this test in quarantine. So it doesn't, be, doesn't get executed anymore for the next run. So the next person that he'll build, this test doesn't get it executed. And then, of course, we have to create an issue because people have to look at it immediately and say, is the test flaky or the code flaky? Code flaky, we have to do something immediately. Test flaky, okay, we have some time. And we installed that, and after, after uh, seven months, our Confluence team had 817 quarantine tests. It's a lot, yeah. So 870. Think about it. How much development time you, you, you save by that, by, by not looking at this and rerun it again. That's a lot, actually. All right. Next bots I want to show you are some, uh, is, an, is an ops bot um, that we built. Uh, so we, we all know the time is over that we just give our software to the ops guys, throw over the wall and say, bye. <laughs> Here we go. It's now your problem. Um, we, are, we are not doing that anymore. It's the age of DevOps. Come on, really. Um, but even though, even though it is the age of DevOps, it's, we, we, we're running in some slow feedback loop here. So a problem occurs. The ops guys got called. They look at the servers. They maybe restart the servers. Um, didn't fix the problem, call, call the developer, the developer says, yeah, I changed something uh, on Friday afternoon, um, so I have to fix it on the weekend, so great, go in. Slow feedback loop, we can make that much, much shorter. Instead of having the ops guys in between, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can have something like the, 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 the service failed, um, the right developer get, get inform, informed uh, and fix, fix it immediately. So we're using actually PagerDuty to help us with, with that um, at Atlassian. So PagerDuty is a commercial tool, and uh, it knows which, which team is responsible for which service. So if that service fails, it calls that team, knows who's on duty. Um, this is not the automation. Um, but it's, it's actually a, a lot of configuration. I mean, we're living in the age of microservices, so new microservice every day. And we have to configure PagerDuty again. So what we did is actually, we, we wrote a little bot in between here. Um, so we have a deployment descriptor. And in the deployment descriptor, we are actually uh, calling out the team name that is responsible for that service. And PagerDuty, or the bot reads that and configures PagerDuty. So PagerDuty knows now, OK, this team is responsible for that service. If that service fails, I can call this, this, this team. Um, and that way, you own your code from end to end, which is, uh, which is pretty important um, that, we, that we do that, uh, that we own our, our own code. All right. Let's move in some, some, some service bots um, and automate our, our, our service, um, our support, actually. So if somebody calls our support, uh, says, oh, we have a problem, um, we say, OK, can you please send us the log file so we can have a look at it? So the support looks at the log file, maybe can't really find an issue in it. 
So what, what the support does is, of course, they, they're calling the developers and say, can you please have a look at it? We, can, we can't really find anything. And we are pretty good at scanning log files as developers. We know, OK, we know this null pointer exception. Yeah, 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 this is normal. Uh, but this one, <laughs> what, what, what's that one? That's, that's a new one. So, and then we, we uh, actually combine that with our, with our system knowledge that we have about the system and say, okay, it must have been this or this or that. And then go back to the support. Okay, works, works, uh, problem solved, that works great. But the, the downside here is the work got paused. We got, we got paused and it, it takes, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes uh, until we go back to that productivity that, that we had actually. Um, so, I mean, I've been talking f uh, about bots now the whole time, so you probably know what's now happening instead of the developer. We have a bot, and this bot has an actual name, and we call him Hercules. And Hercules can actually scan files and has some system knowledge. How does that work? So it scans files, and then we have actually uh, combined Hercules with, with Confluence, and then some Confluence pages. And if you see just on top of that page, there's a machine-readable part. It's a regex, and that we apply to the, to the log file. So Hercules sees that and says, okay, this could be a, a solution for that problem that we just saw in the log file. So he suggests, Hercules suggests stuff uh, to the support person. Support person says, ah, oh, no, that didn't really solve the problem. Okay, this, this can really be the, uh, solve the problem. So Hercules gets smarter and smarter over time. Um, by, by updating Hercules uh, constantly. And we are, we are experimenting now to bring Hercules directly to the, to the users. So if you have a problem and upload your file and Hercules tells you this, is the pro this could be the problem. And the first comment that we got was this here. Well, fuck me, the rubber was right. <laughs> I, I, I re-increased the memory and things work magically. Um, and, the, 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 the people in support that wrote Hercules were so proud that they actually created a t-shirt for that and say, hey, well, fuck me, and darling proudly with the t-shirt around. <laughs> All right. Um, to sum this up, bots are everywhere. They are not just in, in continuous, continuous integration, continuous building, continuous delivering, continuous deployment. They are everywhere. They are, we, we can have bots in the coding phase. We can have bots, of course, to the test phase, but also the ops bots and, and service bots. And probably you have some cool bots also that are running, and you, you need to share that with the community. Um, just an advice, I've been talking, as I said, a lot with, with developers uh, about, about automation code. Treat your bots well. Handle them with care. Um, very, 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 very... Uh, honest advice here. So don't just have that sum the code somewhere. Of course, add it to your source control. Treat it like production code. It's very important. These, we, some, some, sometimes we're depending on these automation codes. So add this to source control and also spread the knowledge within the team. So do code reviews so everyone knows how to fix stuff uh, with the automation code. Um, and also let give other people a chance to, to fix your bots and write tests. Write tests also for your, for your automation code, very important. But the most important thing, I think, is this here. Have deployment scripts for your bots. Uh, so people don't know on which server this, this, this script is running. Having a deployment script makes it easy for people just to say, okay, hit the deployment script, I don't need the credential for the servers. It's there. Um, very important. At the end, you might be afraid that bots take over your job in the future could be, um, because building software is a craft, and we can, we can pretty much automate a lot of stuff of it, so uh, uh, parts of it. Um, so really, this is a craft, but the time we save there, we can spend in adding customer value, because creating customer value, coming up with great architecture, good designs, that's, that's really an art, um, and it's actually hard to automate that part. So we can spend more time of creating customer value uh, and let the bots take over the easy parts here. Um, just an advice at the end of this keynote, don't mess with your bots. Treat them well. Don't do that with your bots. That's not nice, really. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> damn it. Don't do that. It's lame. 
Really, we know if we treat bots like this, what happens? Yeah, they will take over. Skynet will take over, and we will be out of jobs. So treat, treat your bots well. Um, and um, yeah, thank you, for, thank you very much. Thank you.